Shalom, Yashar Allah, all praise Yehovah, Hashem, Yahushai. This is something that was posted on my fence post not too long ago. It's about the book of Nehemiah, Man of Prayer and Action. Is why was Nehemiah afraid prior to addressing the king, verse 2? It was due to this, brother's sorrow of heart. Nehemiah's confident requests indicate that he had not only prayed about this need, but had thought much about the project and planned it out. What do you see to support this? Well, number one, Nehemiah is a Hebrew. That's why uh, before every endeavor, check every angle, research it, you got to think. So it's asking this question, Nehemiah's confident requests indicate that he had not only prayed about this need, but had thought much about the project and planned it out. What do you see to support this? Alright, he's a Hebrew. He looks, um, he looks beyond. What do you see to support this? It's a good question. My answer was, he's a Hebrew. Also, he looks beyond the word I bar. Brothers, that means the uh, region beyond. I barrieth, Eber. All right. And I arose in the night, and some few men with me, and I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Alright, you know, that's during a lot of Babylonian impression what's going on. They're knocking down our walls, you know, setting shit on fire. This one says, How does Nehemiah motivate the Jewish, Jewish officials to rebuild? How do the people respond? Well, you have the other nations cooking out as they always do. How do the people respond? All right, the other nations cooked out specifically in verse 19. All right, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said. What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? You know, they pussyfoot him. That's all it is. Oh, ho, ho, you're not really going to do that. Even though they'd love to see it, you know. This word, it's in English. I notice a lot of these names are, you know, uh, kind of different. You know, pretty different from their English in the Bible. So you got to look it up in Hebrew anyway if you're a name person. You know, you just want to skip through the names in the Bible. I would suggest looking them up in uh, Hebrew and Greek, and if you have a Latin Bible, you know, research some of the Latin Vulgate. Typical heathen behavior, laughing at someone with true ability. That's the answer to that question. That's how they reacted. And the next one is, why can Nehemiah be so confident of success? Well, that goes back to that one. He's a Hebrew. Because the Most High's name means existence, basically. And if you understand the teachings 
you know what you've heard and I'm sure you've stumbled upon the Bible wherever else you stumbled upon if you don't get the presence that the presence of presence is always present it's ever present if you don't feel ever present uh, that's that's kind of impossible being that Yahweh he that exists means existence so we have all these trade skills and these professionals out there who know what they're doing and uh, that shows humongous leadership alright moving on application is there something you're praying about and waiting for the most highest timing what preparation and planning can you be doing during this time now that's right it is about the most highest timing and that's why it skips in Nehemiah from chapter 1 the words of Nehemiah and the son of Hakaliah and it came to pass in the month of Kaslo in the 20th year as I was in Shishan the palace chapter 2 it says and it came to pass in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king that wine was before him and we took up the wine and gave it unto the king now I had not been before time sad in his presence wherefore the king said unto me why is thy countenance sad seeing thou art not sick there is nothing else but sorrow of heart and I was very sore afraid now Artaxerxes is a Persian ruler alright this is during the media Persian Empire that took down Babylon. Now Artaxerxes, you know, he's kind of ignorant in the fact, well, he's ignorant in the fact that he's asking Nehemiah, why are you so sad? Well, if he knew anything about Nehemiah, he was a refugee. He, uh, he's been through hell and back, and his people were killed and slaughtered and his land was taken and his goods were stolen you know there's so many bad things and Artaxerxes is like why is that why is thy countenance sad seeing thou art not sick there's nothing else but sorrow of heart this is nothing else but sorrow of heart and when you witness if you've ever witnessed somebody in life that's given you the ones and twos but in the coldest rudest most heathenistic manner of life kind of humorous here very prophetic the next part of the question is there's something you're praying about and waiting for the most high's timing what preparation planning can you be doing during this time well you could be telling people not to get the mark of the beast which the word beast means chaya which all that means is uh, like a life force you know an essence a representative of uh, a fluent uh, water being or uh, electric current of flow you know don't get the chaya don't get the uh, karagma chaya that's the mark of the beast you dumb fuckers seriously I've had enough of it I mean you, the most high is the most high and this goes back to zooming in on Nehemiah's name of do you consider people who shall be exalted you know do you consider people with humongous responsibility M maybe maybe there's maybe there's Jake in there who looks like a total terror 
Alright. Maybe there's a tear in there. It looks like a total jake. I wonder if you're at the mercy of the Lord of Lords. Is there something you're praying about and waiting for for God's timing? What preparation and planning can you be doing for this time? Well, preparation and planning. There's a show called Doomsday Preppers. Alright. The reason you would be doing this is uh, the prophecy filled as your uh, other nations building up their storehouses. Well, they got bomb shelters. They're afraid the nuclear missiles are coming. You know, they're afraid that the gases are coming. They're afraid that the pressure cookers are coming. They're afraid that the, uh, oh, what was that? They're really good with, oh, the chicken fingers are coming. Alright. So, can you only imagine the preparation that the that the left hand is doing if a chicken tender is dangerous to the point you think it's a gun? No, well, that makes the most high giggle, I imagine. That makes Yahweh, Yahweh Bashem, Yahweh Shai must, it's a, pu a pure sign of humor because you got something important, the chicken tender, you don't know, that might be, that might have been fried in the worst oil ever. Uh, frozen for about maybe close to six months to a year with preservatives from a chicken that might have been cloned or fed a whole bunch of chicken shit uh, and then and then bagged up with other random chickens and uh, you put it in a fryer and then eat it but you know they put in the news that they're dangerous so a prophet watching the news is going to laugh. An apostle of Yahweh is watching the news is going to laugh. You know, a man of the Lord, the man of the Most High, all the, all the four corners of the earth, wherever they be, they're going to have, have humor knowing that not only is it like a gun thing, it was double-edged with the fact that, look at that, man. They straight up busted that little kid, that little child, for a chicken nugget. Okay? So what preparations are we taking? All of us are involved in motivating ourselves, our family, our co-workers. What's one insight into motivating people you can apply from this lesson? Now remember when this question up here said, Nehemiah's uh, confident requests indicate they had not only prayed about this need, but had thought much about the project and planned it out. What do you see to support that? Well, he's a Hebrew. The word Hebrew comes from Eber in the Bible. If you look it up in the English one, it's spelled, it's spelled E B E R. There's a level that we all resonate on, and that's the level of no duh. And if you can't vibe that something's wrong, then you are not alive. And if you can't if you can't feel that something's healthy. Time everyone was speaking Hebrew. All right, everyone was speaking Elash one Kodash. That's why uh, further down in Genesis 11, Abram is born, which is Abraham, which was known as the Hebrew, who was through the lineage of Eber. All right, and it says again, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. That one speech was the last one Kodash Hebrew. All right. Aram had his son. It just became. You know, another slang dialect from the original Hebrew. Because if you speak, if you've heard Aramaic, uh, but the sound is quite similar. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thirdly. Burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime for had they for mortar and they said go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth and the most high came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded and the lord said behold this people is one and they have all one language 
and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained for them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the most has scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Most High did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Most High scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. The word confound is Balal in the Hebrew, Hebrews 11.01, Balal, and it means to mix, to mingle, this shouldn't be in here necessarily to confound. All right. Also found Bilal mingled two only to confound, anointed, mixed, give provider, tempered, to pour over and get the rest of the entry. To pour together. This says to confound, especially speech. Come, we will go down and there confound their lip. So a lot of the other people that are of the earth, that were descendants of Shem, Ham, or Japheth, they were talking Hebrew, similar Hebrews, and doing their own slang, doing their own thing. Now mixing together, the Most High put a spirit upon them from Genesis chapter 11 and 7. All right, let us go down. Let's talk about Yahweh, uh, the Most High, and his angels going down to confound their language. That they pour together their language. So the Most High scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel. The word Babel means Babal, Hebrews 8.94. Confusion by mixing. So this is around the situation that's going down, like his other books in Genesis. The preceding book is often a recap, delves into what happened in the prior chapters, into what is happening meanwhile elsewhere. These are the generations of Shem. She was 100 years old and we got our facts said two years after the flood. Just two years after the flood. So at 35 years old, she begat Salah. And Salah at uh, 30 years begat Eber. And Eber begat Pelag. There was a division on the land. That's what his name means. All right. Of a patriarch, division part, son of Eber. This says Heber. Standard Hebrew, Eber, Ibar, is an ancestor of the Israelites, according to the Table of Nations. He was a great grandson of Noah's son Shem, and the father of Pelag, born when Eber was 34 years old, and Jokhtan. He was son of Shelah, a distant ancestor of Abraham, according to the Hebrew Bible. All right. Eber died at the age of 464, when Jacob was 20. In the Septuagint and other Christian Bibles derived from it, Eber is called Heber. Eber, the great grandson of Shem, refused to help with the building of the Tower of Babel, so his language was not confused when it was abandoned. That's what in the they say Jewish tradition. He probably did refuse to take part in building a gross, little dirty old mucky stone pillar that the Most High had fine and dandy in the rivers and wherever the stones were. But just to give praise to themselves that they are now one people, and they all understand each other's language. You know, that they, they, they may build that tower up to heaven. So his language was not confused when it was abandoned. He and his family alone retained the original human language, Hebrew, a language named after Eber, also called lingua humana in Latin. There are different religious positions on this issue. Well, you look here. Who else was known to be Hebrew? And there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew. You go back to Genesis 11. The whole chapter goes down the lineage of Noah to Shem through Eber all the way to Abraham. All right. Known as the Hebrew, which is Ibaria. Hebrews 5680. I-ba-ra-ya. Ibaria. 
which means one from beyond. Ibar is region from beyond. All right. Designation of the patriarchs of the Israelites. Designation to the patriarchs of the prince of power. Okay. Use 29 other times as Hebrew. Use two times Hebrew woman. Hebrew as Hebrew man. All right. As to the origin of this name it is derived in the Old Testament itself from the name Eber. Where it is well rendered by this word differs from the Israelites. In that the latter was the patronymic, patrona, patronymic derived from the ancestor of the people. Which was used amongst the nation itself. So before they were calling themselves Israel. All right, before Jacob was able to be born and called Israel, before that could happen, they identified themselves as Ibaria, one from beyond. All right, applied by the Canaanites to the Hebrews as having crossed the Euphrates and immigrating un into Canaan, and it was commonly used by foreign nations. So the Old Testament only called the Israelites Hebrews when foreigners are introduced as speaking or when the Israelites themselves speak of themselves to foreigners or when used in opposition to other nations as to what others have imagined that Israelites was a sacred name while Hebrews was for common use. This is without foundation because they were known at that time to keep their language. All right. The language of Ibar. So look here and see what Aram means. You'll see it's Hebrews 7, 5 and 8. Aram, which is, means high place or lofty, uh, exalted. Aram, Aramean is exalted. For or Syria, the nation. Armenian, Ar Armenian. Or Syrian people you see it represents Syria 67 times Syrians 56 times Aram only seven times so it's definitely talking about Syria so if Aram begat the language of the Lord why did the Lord talk to Paul on his way to Damascus which is which is part of the part of the uh, lofty elevated regions in which Aram actually settled and where Aramaic spread rapidly during the separation of languages, you know, a prophecy of Pelagmi born. This is to be high, to swell up, to exalt oneself. You know, doesn't Aramaic tend to say, oh yeah, that's the fucking original language. Well, you're wrong. I believe you're wrong. I believe you're totally wrong. It's the same language. It's a good comparison to say that you know how in the United States there's different forms of English, even though it's the same language, different slangs. Just like in Great Britain and London, from those on the highlands and the lowlands, uh, they're going to have a different dialect, but it's going to be the same language. Same thing with Aramaic and Hebrew. All right? Height, high region, Aramea, Ar 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 Aramaeans, or Syria, Syrians, the name of Aramea, however, extends more widely than that of Syria and also includes Mesopotamia. We should generally understand Western Syria, or that properly so-called, especially Syria of Damascus. Where Mesopotamia is intended, it is called Syria of the Two Rivers. Some people are trying to say, though, it's the same la language uh, Yahweh Shai spoke, but it isn't. You know, let's go here. Aramaic, Aramaic, let's zoom in on this. Aramaic is a member of the ancient Shemitic family, which it is because Lud or facts that had even Elam of the, uh, the East Indies, they're considered Aramaic, I mean Shemitic. Family of languages includes Hebrew and Arabic, although the names are similar, Aramaic and Arabic are not the same. The Aramaic alphabet consists of 22 letters. Just like Hebrew, written from right to left. Originally, the language of the uh, Arameans who inhabited northwestern Mesopotamia slash Syria, the various dialects of Aramaic were eventually widely used over a vast area. Were eventually widely used. Hebrew was always used. All right, from Greece to India. 
which included Galilee in northern Israel, Aramaic was the everyday language of Yehoshai Mashiach, along with Hebrew and Greek. No, the original language of Yehoshai Mashiach was Hebrew, Ibaria, one from beyond. Was the everyday language of, along with Hebrew and Greek. Now, Greek's totally different. You know, the characters, how it says, totally different from Lashawan, Kodash, and uh, Aramaic. But like I said before, Aramaic's just a different twang on the original language Hebrew from beyond. Aramaic was evident throughout Bible history. Jacob spoke Hebrew while Laban spoke Aramaic. Like you can see, if Laban speaking Aramaic and Jacob speaking Hebrew, it's pretty much the same language if they kind of understand each other. Genesis 31 and 41. Thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I served thee 14 years for thy two daughters and six years for thy cattle. And thou hast changed my wages 10 times. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had been with me. Surely thou had sent me away now empty. God hath seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked thee yesternight. And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. And what can I do this day unto these my daughters or unto their children which they have borne? Because look what it says later. Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. Genesis 31 47. And Laban called it, Yagar Sahadwatha, but Jacob called it Gilead, Galiad. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. This heap, and exa that's exactly what it feels like when you're trying to distinguish Aramaic between Hebrew with someone who draws a line in the sand right there. Therefore, was the name of it called Gilead. All right, what's Gilead in Hebrew? Hebrews 15:67 means witness heap, witness heap. So what Laban was saying was Yagar Shadwatha, Yagar Shadwatha, right? Which is a witness heap. He's like, oh, look at that, a pile of stones. The mound of stones raised as witness between Jacob and Laban. Raised as witness between watch, the Iquab, Hebrews 32.90. The Iquab, all right, heel holder or supplanter. All right, supplanter. So that's just his spirit, his destiny. What's Laban? Nahum breathes strongly to be sorry, to rue, console, to pity, comfort self, ease oneself, repent oneself. Five one six two. It's Nahum and three zero five zero is Yah. Alright, so Yahweh comforts, Yahweh consoles, 